quite skilled at breaking into my own home. So I did that this morning. <laughs> yes. All right. So um, friends, today we're going to talk a little bit about um, John 10 verses mm -hmm. one through 10. But in particular, I wanted to kind of do a little bit of explaining for you. So um, since Easter Sunday, we have been in this series we're calling Open Invitation. And um, one of my like prevailing, I don't know, bugaboos is that we do all of this worship planning around these themes. And then we don't always do a great job of connecting the dots for you guys. So I'm going to do that today. <laughs> I'm going to do that for you. Um, so we started on Easter morning with the open tomb. Um, that doesn't need to be explained too deeply to you, I assume. Um, the next week we talked about open hands, um, and that was, you know, talking about Thomas's narrative of how he, um, kind of needed to be able to see Jesus' hands in his side in order to believe um, that it really was Jesus. And um, along with that, I think there's a really heartening message about the way that Jesus is totally cool with that <laughs> um, and has, in fact, created kind of real precedent for giving us what we need in order to have faith. So, right, he meets Mary in the garden, calls her by name. Um, he meets with the disciples in the upper room and immediately shows them his wounds just as a you know, preemptory measure, um, and then does the same with Thomas. And then finally, um, or penultimately, we get to open eyes, which was last week. So that's the story of um, the disciples on their road to Emmaus on the day of resurrection. They're a little bit blindsided by everything that's going on, um, and then walk along with Jesus without knowing it, him. Until Jesus, again, does the thing <laughs> that he did for all the other disciples, which is reveal himself in something familiar and something needed so that all of those who are there have what they need to be able to, to know Jesus and follow Jesus. And that leads us to this week, which is the open gate. So um, we're going to be talking about this passage from John where Jesus does a couple of interesting things in terms of creating metaphors for himself. Um, and I'm hoping that we might be able to look at this scripture in a way that you have not done so before. So let's just start off by reading through the scripture. So this begins with John 10 verse one. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. <clears throat> when he has brought out all of his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will not run for him because they do not, or no, yeah, they will not run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Um, so this is the good news from the gospel of John. Thanks be to God, right? Um, so as I've been reading through this um, passage, th there are some really kind of deep nuggets about knowing who Christ is and, and our invitation to relationship with Christ. But here it sits at the end of this series about openness and it has caused me to ask this prevailing question how can a gate be a sign of inclusion rather than exclusion um it, it doesn't seem to fit off the bat um so i just want to kind of get get your discussion brains moving a little bit i'm going to show you a series of images of gates and I'm hoping that y'all can just popcorn out like what it makes you think of. Um, just give me a word or two. Andy, you want to go for it? Yeah. 
Yeah, exclusion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, fishing. Yes. <laughs> Let's mix all of our biblical metaphors. Yeah. <laughs> It's a pretty unfriendly gate, right? We've got like barbed wire on there. Uh, oh. Is looking a little janky. <laughs> Can we move on to the next one? Brandenburg gates in Berlin. What? What did I? I'm sorry. What did I? Majestic. Yeah, yeah. It shows. It shows power, right? Um, and kind of dominance. Like this is. I think there are like ten gates outside of Berlin. Um, it, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It it shows it shows the power of of um, what's within. Let's move to the next one. Although these are gates that can't be closed. No, these are gates that can't be closed. You'll see right here they have like barriers here, but like in in um when these were originally used, they would have been armed, right? Like there would have been people manning them. Um, but as as we all oh yeah, go ahead. Brandenburg Gate was pretty much totally destroyed World War II. And that is obviously a picture of the rebuilding. Yes, and yes. There is a persistence. Yeah, that it's a it is a it is a cultural identifier for Berlin. Like um I was reading a Conde Nast travel yesterday because I was like, I need to know a little bit about um the Brandenburg Gates. And that was part of what they shared, and they said basically. Like if you come to Ber Berlin, it's the most touristy thing to do and you should absolutely do it. Like it is just, it is it is the symbol of Berlin. Um, you just gotta go. So yeah, so it has like a totemic function here. Let's move to the next one. Oh, sorry. Anybody know this gate? Yeah, that's right. It's Traitor's Gate at the Tower of London. This is how they would bring people in um, to before they were imprisoned, and most of the time, usually um, executed. Yeah, that's a one-way gate. Keep people in. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of messages does it give you? Oh yeah, I would say so. I also I chose a picture with like the least gross water. Um, the water's so gross, y'all. <laughs> that in itself is not great. All right, let's move to the next one. <laughs> yeah, or a baby gate. Safety, yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, man. Have them in your house way too long. Snow toe, right? Snow toe, yeah. So maybe slightly inconvenient, but essentially there to create safety for everyone. Um, and then let's do our final one. And you'll notice what about this gate? Accurate. <laughs> it basically doesn't exist. Um, which is kind of um, where I want to bring us today. So talking, I always feel like it's important to do a little bit of diving into these agricultural metaphors because, um, you know, some of you may have had very different lives than I have had, but I have zero experience with sheep. Um, and so while this would have been, yeah, while this would have been a really potent metaphor for people at the time, it means zero to me now um and zero to a lot of us so the metaphor of sheep and shepherds gets used a whole lot through scripture is a really potent metaphor for them at the time um but the way that we see it mostly um is as a metaphor for kingship and rulership right the king is the good shepherd and the the people are the sheep um we see that throughout the Old Testament, particularly like that is a metaphor that makes sense. And it's even outside of scripture, other texts of the time would use that, right? So, um, which is kind of odd because when we think of kings or we think of rulers, we have a very different, I don't know, I think we have a very different kind of understanding of what that power looks like, right? Um, you know, think of 
Brandon Burton Gates, right? Think of Buckingham Palace, think of um, Game of Thrones. Like that is all, very, that is a very different way of executing power. But um, even outside the Bible, the idea of a king that has responsibility for care of the people, for safety of the people, and has like an element of understanding and knowledge of the people was was kind of ideal, right? And think about King David. King David was a shepherd, and in many ways, he is the biblical idea of of kinghood, king kingship. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. Another thing that is important for you to know about shepherds of this time is that they were in many ways and many times the actual gates. So you'll see, this is just an illustration, but you see the shepherd lying across the entrance to the sheepfold. This would have been pretty common, even if there was an actual wooden gate. Um, from what we can tell, it would have been very common for the shepherd to either sleep in front of that gate um, or beside it, basically functioning as a gatekeeper or a second round of defense, right? So the shepherd as functioning also as a gate is keeping bandits out or keeping you know predators out of the sheepfold, is keeping the sheep, sheep safely in. Um, and I think the kind of Im important element of this too where it really becomes relevant to our understanding of Christ is that the shepherd is putting himself on the line here, right? The the shepherd is acting as 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 the barrier, which means that the shepherd is bearing not only the responsibility for the sheep, but also the the risk that standing between sheep and predators or sheep and bandits inherently entails. Um, and so thinking of Christ as the shepherd and the gate helps us to understand um, this metaphor that Jesus is using here. Because as we read through scripture, Jesus is doing something a little bit notable. I'm actually, um, Andy, you don't have to follow me, but I'm going to go back to the scripture for a second. So Christ starts out talking to those who are gathered and saying that um, he is the shepherd, right? Like the sheep know my voice. They, uh, they know who I am. I am the one who is keeping out the bandits. Um, and, and he's identifying himself as, as the shepherd. But then we get this fun little nugget in there that says, Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Um, which happens rather a lot with Jesus parables and Jesus allegories. We hear that in scripture. And then of course we know that to be true because frequently we also get confused. Um, and honestly, I think this is another common factor in John's writing. John is, um, John is the gospel writer who is most concerned with like the, you know, ethereal divinity of Jesus. And so when John here, when John writes Jesus, right, the way that John writes Jesus speaking, Jesus always kind of sounds crazy to me, <laughs> like not the kind of person I would follow because Jesus, Jesus was always talking about like, I am blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, it's just, it's so mystical. It's kind of hard to grasp. And um, John's version of Jesus doesn't always make a ton of sense to me. So I am right here um, with Jesus followers here being a little bit confused because he draws this whole analogy of him being the shepherd. And then he switches when they don't understand that. And he says, very truly, I tell you that I am the gate for the sheep. Um, so, you know, having to kind of grapple with that, I think the best way for us to understand that is as Jesus is, is to understand Jesus as the shepherd who also functions as the gate, the kind of shepherd who's willing to put his life on the line for his sheep, the kind of shepherd who is willing to um, act as, as the way, right? As the way to and from um, the, the gatekeeper who is also the gate. And so if we kind of accept this idea, we have to kind of hold both of these images together. Um, so if Jesus is the shepherd, we know that he is the shepherd because we know Jesus, we know his voice, we know his actions. 
Um, and it's Jesus who is then leading us in and leading us out. Um, and we're willing to follow Jesus because we do know his name and we do know his actions. We have um, that kind of relationship of trust that has already been established. And then if we're going to also hold the image of Jesus as the gate, we know some other things about Jesus, right? We know not only we know him not only by familiarity and by his actions, but we know specifically his willingness to sacrifice himself for us, which incor- like incorporates into it some of those shepherd things, but also um, really kind of bumps up the idea of, of the trust that we are called to have in Christ. And I think the thing that is notable to me is that the gate, the gate shepherd keeps us safe because we are children of God, right? Because we are sheep. Um, it is our sheepness or sheepiness um, that allows us to be protected by a gate such as Jesus. And um, so to me, kind of coming back to the central question that I had posed before, how can a gate be a sign of inclusion and exclusion? This is this is kind of where it comes down. If we understand Jesus as this shepherd gate, um, which is probably how I'll refer to it in the sermon on Sunday. So people who get confused, you can help them understand. Um, is signifying a deep trust, a deep foundational trust that is based on who Christ is and who Christ has been for us and for others in the past. It's knowing his voice, knowing his actions, knowing that we can rely upon God. Um, That can create an openness because we can be vulnerable if we can trust those around us. I think Jesus as the shepherd slash gate also Uh, uh, demonstrates an authenticity of character that is important when we're talking about um, inclusion and when we're talking about Christian community, right? I think um, particularly in churches like ours, there can be a real impulse, I think, to put the best face on everything. Um, And we know that that's not what life is, right? Um, We know that things are sometimes difficult. We know that we all have aspects of our personalities that are maybe a little bit quirky and hard to understand. Um, And Jesus shows us that that's okay because Jesus shows his full self. We know Christ's voice. We know Christ in like having been through this whole season of not knowing Jesus, right? Mary doesn't know Jesus immediately. The disciples don't know him on the road immediately. Thomas doesn't know him immediately. But here we come to the culmination, right? Where we can inherently know and trust Christ. Um, And we do that because of his, his authenticity of character. Obviously there's idea of creating places of safety and security so that the sheep can be safe. And I think that is important too, when we think about what welcome and inclusion looks like, right? That we're creating, we're creating environments where folks feel like they are enfolded by love and acceptance and, and I mean, security, right? We know that there are lots of places where um, we may not feel safe, right? Um, There might be you know, work environments that feel hostile or even like family environments that don't feel great. Like Thanksgiving table under certain circumstances does not feel like a safe zone. (laughs) Um, and, and so the idea of thinking about Christ as a gate that offers inclusion is about kind of saying, Hey, um, I am creating a place for you where you can be who you are. And you can do that safely. And then I think finally, the, this very last sentence, which I did not spend a whole lot of time on with you all, but may dig into a little bit more as we, um, as I prepare this week is this idea of, of Christ's ultimate intention to bring us abundant life, right? So this protection isn't for its own safe, uh, for, for its own sake, right? Like we're not being kept safe and alive just to be kept safe and alive. The idea is that we will have lives that are meaningful and um, full of richness and goodness and joy and kindness and love, and that those kinds of abundant lives will not only benefit us, but will benefit our entire communities, the entire world, right? We are being, we are being kept safe 
for a reason. We are being nurtured for a reason. And that is so that we can nurture others. So before we move on to our discussion questions for this week, I wanted to just open it up and see if y'all have any questions or if there's anything that's really resonating with you that you're like, hey, you should dig into that a little bit more. Or is it too early to do that? <laughs> yes. Just for in the story, I like, I'm better at being the sheep protector than the yeah. sheep follower. Yeah. Yeah, we don't like that. But, but I mean, that is ultimately kind of what the goal is, right? That we would follow in Christ's example. <laughs> um, maybe not mindlessly. And in fact, no, not mindlessly, because what this passage actually, you know, infers is that, or implies, it implies, I know the difference between those words. <laughs> what this implies is that, um, is that like, there will be bandit shepherds out there, right? That we will have the opportunity to follow lots of things, but we being wise sheep who know Christ and know our shepherd, um, and are protected by this type of gate will not be fooled by those bandit shepherds. Um, our falling will not be mindless. It will be done out of deep trust and knowledge of the person who we are following. I guess the other yeah. thing that occurs to me is that you go through the gate for rest and peace. And mm -hmm. you need that. Yeah. Shepherd provides that safety for, for us to rest. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I was wondering about, I don't remember, does the analogy or the inference to the production that the sheep gives back to the shepherd? Um, or, yeah. Get sheared for wool. <laughs> <laughs> this you know, particular. But what are we to produce? Is my point. Uh, my question. Yeah, that's a good question, and I'm not sure that this particular passage is going to give you the answers that you want. But I think that one of the things that um, you're getting at is kind of alluded to a bit, right? At the. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Nathan asked about. Um, so what is the utility of the sheep, essentially, right? That um, we have an ob or that that Christ, the shepherd gate, has an obligation to us. But what is the reciprocity of that? What are we to give back? Um, and kind of how does how is that a reciprocal relationship? And here's the thing: like I'm not I'm not sure that it is. Um, <laughs> But let me get to something else first. Uh, the, the first thing I will say is that there is a verse in here. Um, verse nine talks about how Christ is the gate. Folks will come in and go out, right? So so we come in to find rest and safety, but we're again sent out. Um, in this verse, he says that we'll be sent out and find pasture, um, which really just alludes to us being able to continue to eat and be safe outside the sheepfold. Um, but I don't know that it necessarily points us in a direction of um, productivity or output. Um, but I think ultimately my response to that is we, as sheep of Jesus, the shepherd gate, as, as followers of Christ, I think we do have an obligation for some level of productivity, which I think for us looks like, you know, making the world that we live in a better place. But I'm not sure that we have that obligation in the kind of transactional way that a shepherd might care for his sheep, right? That um, we don't, we don't do those things because they are, um, we, we don't do that. We don't do those things out of like necessity and obligation um, that is kind of like contractual, right? Like you do this, I do that. It's more like a free flowing response to the love and the grace that we have received, um, which I think is like a, a an actually pretty uh, ethereal like concept that I don't know that I'm prepared to talk about a whole lot today. Um, because it's it's hard to wrap your head around. 
Um, but I, I think in some ways that's one of the gifts of Christ, right? Um, is that we are all given this amazing grace. We are all given this love that we could never earn. And the ways that we show that in the world, the ways that we pay it forward, as it were, are going to differ based on our capacity, based on our gifts, based on our experiences and our social location and things like that. And I think that that is, um, that's an important thing, right? Like it's not just a tit for tat. It's like a holistic kind of approach to, to life in Christ. Yeah. Pope St. Arrhenius, the glory of God is a man fully alive. Um, Glory of God is also a rock that sits in its place and uh, is a rock. Uh, It's it's a tree growing the way it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. It's it's us becoming the people that we were created to be. And they're not all the same, but that's another story. Yeah, yeah. So, So we're... um. We're, uh, we're created to fulfill this design that, that's in us, so to speak, mm-hmm. right? Well, I think for the sheep, that's pretty easy, all right? He's yeah. supposed to eat for good people. Yeah. So um, I think that he's doing that. He's he's fulfilling his role. And, and that's um, pleasing to God and um, probably pleasing to the sheep. Yeah, probably. Let's hope. Let us hope. For us, it's a little different, though, isn't it, Pat? Right? That that knowing what it means. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have many other factors. The contractual thing, I think, is to follow Jesus. Yeah, that's that's the role. Is once you're out of the gate, to follow Jesus and don't wander away. Yeah, and that's going to look is going to look a little different. For all of us um but yeah follow you're you're right that's a really good point john yeah sure yes <laughs> it wasn't even really a question uh it was more an insight that uh pat had to share with us which is um the statement of saint irenaeus that um the glory of god is a man fully alive fully alive right and so um that our purpose is to grow into the creatures that God has created us to be. And in the case of sheep, that means that, you know, they flourish, they don't do something stupid and like eat something that will kill them. They just, they eat, they reproduce, they create wool. Um, Maybe sometimes they create meat, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, (laughs) And how for us, um, the answer gets a little bit more complicated in terms of figuring out how we become fully alive. But um, John pointed out that maybe the simplest answer to that is that like sheep, we just follow where Christ leads. Um, And that's our purpose. That's, that's our side of, that's our response to the goodness that we, that we enjoy. I also think it's interesting that we're, I feel like we're out in the pasture a lot trying to do something mm-hmm. to produce. Yeah. And it gives this image of finding life to the full by coming in and, yeah. by, and by getting rest. Yes. Like, coming, uh, like my yoke, my yoke is easy. Mm-hmm. To the safe sanctuary. Yeah. Rest and abide in me. And that's how we get life. Yeah. To the full. That's <laughs> contrary to what I feel like that. <laughs> yeah, I like that. that. We always know it's there. We can make it back there eventually. Well, or it's not even, I mean, I think what Brian was getting at, um, Brian kind of offers the insight that we (laughs) that we find rest in the pasture, that we spend a lot of time, or we find rest in the sheepfold. We spend a lot of time out in the pasture trying to be productive. Um, and then other Brian uh, (laughs) talks about (laughs) I'm like bookended by Brian's here. Um, talks about how we spend a lot of time out in the pasture having fun. And I think you're kind of getting at different things, right? Where the the pasture can be a place of great opportunity and joy, and it can also be a place of great burden. And so the idea that we do have a place where we can be um, refreshed and nourished in the sheepfold, um, where we can find rest, where we can find secure rest, where we know that we're not vulnerable, uh, is really important to our thriving. 
Um, Bill, I see a hand back there, I think. Oh, no, I was just wondering. Yeah, or our capacity, like our capacity for faith. I think, I think that's kind of where you're getting right. We're like where we are wired to be able to respond to God, um, just as sheep are wired to be able to kind of recognize fear and recognize safety. Um, if you were here, if you heard Kathy preach during um, Holy Week, she had preached about how um, in sheep slaughter situations sheep will inherently know that something fishy is going on and so what they will do um or what has been done i don't think they do it everywhere um but one of the things that is common practice mm -hmm. is to have a sheep that they refer to as the judas sheep who like lives at at the facility and like when the sheep kind of come on the truck the judas sheep will come on and just you know like sniff around and they'll get used to him and uh as he leaves, the sheep will follow him because they have deemed him safe. Um, and so there's something about sheep that is, that are like, that is receptive to that notion of vulnerability and um, danger and also what is safe. And so I think there's, I think you're getting at something and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to articulate it super well, but like the idea that we too are wired to kind of know um, to know God when we encounter God and to be able to look for and recognize God's presence, which can also be called faith. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, we are at 740. And so I want to make sure that you have adequate time to discuss. I have a couple of discussion questions for it, for you. And I know that you are not in your normal orientation around tables. So, um, Andy, do you want me to come come up with a breakdown or we want no, people we'll to just, great. Oh my gosh, I love it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> talk amongst yourselves, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, so here are your discussion questions. We'll keep them up on the screen. Um, the first is to tell a notable time about when you were let into something that was important to you and um, how that felt and whether it made a difference in your life. Um, so, and the second question is about authentic leadership, the kind of leadership where we kind of know your voice and we know how, know who you are and know whether or not we can trust you. And the third is um, about the concept of gatekeeping. So if we were to practice gatekeeping in a way that models Christ's example, what might that look like? Questions, concerns, Object fears before we break up. Mm -hmm. No. All right. Well, gentlemen, talk amongst yourselves. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. Uh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you.